God, we praise you. Thank you for this opportunity. God, allow our ears to hear what the Scripture tells us, to really um, take to heart. We're gonna, we stand on the shoulders of some of the very people we'll be talking about tonight and help us to respect them, what they've done, what they did so many, many years ago that we could have faith. God, we, we praise you and we thank you for this opportunity. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let me take just a minute to uh, mention Sunday is Easter. Um, Friday night is the good uh, or the service of darkness night on Good Friday at 8 o'clock here at the church. A very powerful service every year, and we look forward to that. So I want to invite all of you to come. It's usually a good, good crowd for that. So we look forward to that. Uh, 8 o'clock Friday night. Um, I had one of the youngsters come to me tonight and told me he was going to be here Friday night and all excited about it and then he said granddaddy would be here too but he died and uh, I had preached his grandfather's funeral a few months ago and he said um, he would have been here so and it, it just I don't know it touched me the way he said that obviously very important but very important service and then Sunday morning at 7 we're going to have a prayer service outside if the weather's good around back on this side of the gym. Just going to put some chairs out there for us to sit in and, and uh, have a prayer time. Not a long, long time, not a speaking or music or anything. Just get together and pray and uh, give thanks that morning for what the day represents. And then there'll be some breakfast foods around. Worship service at 9 we will have worship in the gym also going on. Same service in here, back there at the same time. Uh, I think we've got most all the bugs worked out. I said I reserve the um, right to have a bug, but I don't think we'll have any problems. Uh, it's been going wonderful. We've got a new camera sitting right back there over the door that's doing a fantastic job for us. So service back there is just the same thing as service in here. And then uh, we're going to do that both services for spillover. So if it's like last year, we'll have 1,400 people here, 13, 1,400 people here. So it gets real crowded in here. So we're going to be set up for that. So I want to encourage you, you know, if you've not been back there, to go and enjoy it. I think you'll enjoy it back there, um, the way it, way it happens. So that's going to be Sunday. Okay. Uh, First Peter, the circumstances. How many of you know, don't say it, but how many of you know what that first blank is? Nero blank while Rome burned. How many of you know what that word is? I thought everybody would, okay? What is it? Fiddled. Fiddled. It's an old phrase. Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Nero was uh, over the Roman Empire. And this is the whole background which will make First Peter come alive and I want to mention to you um, as just a note of study in Scripture that a whole lot of the trouble we get into today in studying Scripture could be solved like that if people would just learn the background of a letter, why it was written, who it was written to. And then you can see tons of application that um, happens for where we are in life today. So you're going to get the background of why 1 Peter, 2 Peter was written. 1 Peter especially uh, will deal with Nero and what was going on. Here are several, uh, here's a little bit of background. Rome was a wooden city as it would have been then with narrow streets. And Nero was known for liking to build. He loved to build big ornate buildings. And he wanted to redo Rome with his print on it. And the Senate wouldn't let him. They wouldn't finance it. Uh, there was a lot of friction there. And then a fire broke out in Rome. And uh, he was rather happy it burned. It burned for three days. They got it, they thought, put out once, stopped, and it relit. And there were even people said they saw people come and relight the fire. Okay? That was in... Um, July the 19th, it's recent enough history that putting it on our calendar, they even know the exact date, was July the 19th of the year 64. So Nero fiddled while Rome burned. So I gave you a couple of quotes there I think you'll find interesting. This was written about him by someone who was with him. Said he was charmed with the flower and loveliness of the flames as he sat and watched it burn. Now, 
You'll see what this has to do with the scripture in a few minutes. But he, he loved that it was burning, okay? And um, Farrar, who was a, a contemporary historian of the day, wrote, it was a hopeless, we, the people became homeless. Many, 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 many people. You can imagine the winds and everything whipping a wooden fire for three days just roaring out of control. And so there were a lot of businesses destroyed, a lot of people homeless, some people killed, obviously. And he described the people that were left wandering the streets as a hopeless brotherhood of wretchedness. I could not help but think of what we see going on in the countries in the Middle East now, that hopeless, hopeless brotherhood of wretchedness and the, and the tremendous suffering people are going through. And then Tacius, who uh, is a very well-known historian, wrote of it, quote, he falsely diverted the charge to a set of people to whom the vulgar gave the name Christians, okay? The word Christian was not a complimentary term when it was attributed to us. And so he says just very, very easily, very plain, that Nero knew he was in trouble. He was in tremendous political trouble. People were blaming him, and he knew he needed to divert it, so he diverted the blame for this fire to the Christians, okay? Horrible things begin to happen. Absolutely horrible things begin to happen because of it. So I want you to, I want you to grasp that. He falsely diverted the charge to a set of people to whom the vulgar gave the name Christians. Now, here's the evidence, um, and keep in mind what's burned. People's homes, people's businesses, but the Greek gods, every so often there would be a shrine to one of them. Luna had one, uh, Venus, all these different people had these, uh, are, are gods and goddesses. They'd get built these real ornate, and people had the little icons in their in their houses and everything, and all their shrines burned. So the Greek God's temples are gone. So Nero faced this uprising, and what he came up with is we'll blame the Christians. We'll blame them for everything that is wrong. Now, here's what's real important to understand about the Christians. The Roman Empire had what they called legitimate religions and illegitimate religions of the day, religions they would allow to exist and others that it was legally wrong. They allowed the Jewish faith to exist. You know, they occupied Israel, keep them happy, let them go to their temple, let them go to their synagogues, let them do whatever they want. They're not causing us any trouble, but leave them alone. Leave them alone. Wasn't the right phrase for that music. God is watching. Okay. But leave them alone. And so they did, and they left the Christians alone on the assumption they were just a bunch of Jews. They made the, they made the assumption that the Jewish faith was just part of the Jewish faith, or the Christian faith was just part of the Jewish faith or a subset of it. And so you'll even find where the magistrates and all in Rome would try to help Paul and different ones up until this point. And now they're going to find out that the Christians are different from the Jewish faith, and Nero is going to really, really do some horrible things. So here's the evidence against the Christians. Number two, they already are victims of slander. So they're ready. They're already getting blamed for some things, so let's just throw some more things on them. Already victims of slander. The second thing is they're connected with the Jews. Now, while the Jewish faith was considered okay, the Jewish people were tremendously disliked. Anti-Semitism that, that's alive and well today. So in Rome... Uh, said, you know, they're just a bunch of Jews, these Christians. Hang that on them, and uh, let's, uh, let's blame them for everything. And any time you have that, there's Jews willing to sell their own people down the road. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, Nero had a mistress who was Jewish, and he also had a favorite actor in the, in the Roman plays that was Jewish. And they did not like their own people. They were living wealthy and looking down their nose at their own people and all. And it is believed she helped turn him against Jews even more so than his racial prejudice would have already been. So 
He's got this evidence against the Christians. The Lord's Supper was held in secret. The third evidence. Now, what if you if you knew nothing about the Lord's Supper? Nothing. You came from a totally foreign culture. You'd never heard anything about communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist, any, any name you want to give. And you listen to just a description from the Scripture about the Lord's Supper. I stand up as the minister and say, on the night he was betrayed, he said, Take, eat, this is my body, eat it, and this is my blood, drink all of it. What's that automatically sound like to you? Huh? Flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, but it sounds like what's going on. Somebody said it. Cannibalism. And so that was easy to find that flame among the Romans. These people get together in this secret little deal and talk about cannibalism. Now, if, uh, if I come up to you and say, have you heard what these Christians are doing? And you hear that, and you go and tell somebody, you know, my, my friend David seems to know what's going on, and, you know, he's pretty well connected there in the city council or whatever around Rome, or he's investigated, or he was even in that group for a while, and he told me they eat flesh and blood. And then you go tell somebody, did you hear? Well, it takes to about Ed, if we skip two, to turn it into their cannibals. And there was even traceable rumors of... Uh, Christians, it being said of Christians at that time that they had eaten some Gentile children. Okay? So now Nero's fighting for his political wife, and let's blame these Christians. Now you're going to see the capstone of how he made it stick here in a minute. So um, Christians, at the time Peter's getting ready to write this letter, are being having all sorts of things blamed on them. Now, the term for that today would be it was false news. No, fake news. Fake news. But anyway, that's what's being said. Christians, this fourth one down under that number two, tampered with family relationships. Somebody explain that to me. Why would that be said? Mm -hmm. So they'd heard that. And how would they have seen it really happen, family issues tampered with? Okay, the Jewish people converted been totally ostracized and some of the Gentiles that had been converted were going back and saying we don't really take a liking anymore to all these gods and goddesses you've come up with, these mythologies. Okay, so it created a lot of problems in families. Okay, fifth one. Let's go to the last one first. Christians threatened the morality of Rome. Now, I want to use just one incident, and that would be a Jewish mistress to the Roman emperor and this, uh, this, this morality that teaches a man and a woman in a marriage and would teach Christian morality, Judeo-Christian morality, but Christian morality would be a huge threat, so a lot of people would already be angry over that. And then the last one, I've got it next to last there. But they spoke of the world dissolving in flames. Christians did. Okay? Why did the Christians speak of the world dissolving in flames? Where's that come from? Huh? Yeah, the end times teaching and prophecies and there was a flood the next time I'll destroy with fire and this type of stuff. And they're talking about a place called hell as as punishment, and you get that all twisted, I tell you about it, you know, Christ died for you so you wouldn't be burning in hell, he loves you that much, you don't deserve it, and you really don't deserve it, oh, that's sad, <laughs> no, but anyway, and so they've heard this teaching, and so Nero has it just ready-handed to him, blame the Christians, blame the Christians, now, I meant to bring it in here, and um, um, read some examples to you and I forgot to carry the book in with me I left it on my back but anyway um, number three the results the Romans invented ways of torture or I'm going to say Nero invented ways of torture and death 
ways of torture and death were invented. Um, I apologize, I didn't carry that in with me, to read to you from some of the contemporary historians of the day of what was done to Christians. But let it suffice to say without the flowery language, well-written language of, of their time, that it was horrible. And two that really stand out in my mind, they would take the Christians, strip them, and wrap them in wild animal clothes, wild animal skins, where they would strip an animal, skin an animal, and then they'd throw them into the Colosseums and turn loose starving wild dogs. And for entertainment, watch them be torn to shreds. And they did that to not one or two, but many, many, many people. And more, three, at least three historians I read wrote about the Christians being put on post, uh, stuck on post, and uh, oil thrown on them and lit to light the gardens at night. And Nero turned this into a, a, a circus-type atmosphere and did it in the gardens of where he lived, his palace or where he lived. So there was tremendous torture, tremendous anger unleashed. These Christians burned our city. They didn't like them anyway. And the horrible, horrible things that were done to them. Um, and so Christianity, under number three, was termed uh, illegal. Now that goes back to Judaism had been accepted, but Christianity and it was now called illegal, and there were tremendous uh, tortures took place. Now, everyone has seen in a movie or something the the depiction of the Colosseum and people being thrown to the lines and everything. This is the period of time that was happening in. Historically, this is when this was happening. It was not a long, long time. I'm not talking 20, 30 years. But Christians, Christians were absolutely abused beyond belief in horrible ways. Um, now, why is this, why is this um, important teaching for us today? Okay. They set an example of faith. Let me ask this question, uh, and I, and I don't mean this in any mean way or any wrong way. One of those, oh, I got to, you know. We'll have thirteen or fourteen hundred people here Sunday, and I honestly, I, I want to say something to preface this. I honestly don't remember who said what with all the things that are said on Sunday morning, and and please don't hear that wrong, but. If, Jerry Eads, my friend since 1990, says something to me. Oh, I can't go out of here and say, well, Jerry said that, you know, if it's a little something, I remember it said, but not exactly who. So don't anybody hear this. This is not some blind shot at anybody. But what do we complain about on Sundays? Just Sunday morning. It's too, too cold. Too cold two every pancake no matter how thin has two sides okay it's too cold it's too okay too loud not loud enough the light bothers me we need more okay now i learned this term from my son living in haiti that's a first world problem okay how many people are going to be here Sunday? Estimate, you heard me say a while ago, going by the last years, 13, 1400. How many would be here Sunday if they were putting us in wild animal clothes and feeding us to ravenous dogs? How many people would we lose from a normal Sunday? You know, I don't know the answer, but I think we'd lose some. There would be some we would gain. You know, but we would lose some. I, and, and there'd be all sorts of reasons. Well, I'm not going. I, I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm the preacher, and I'm too important. So I'm not going to go Sunday. They need to go face that, but I'm the preacher. I should stay at home and be safe. Right? Um, but anyway, we'd come up with all sorts of excuses. What if I told you Peter wrote this letter? And I'm going to really loosely paraphrase it saying, no excuses. 
There's no excuses. Okay? Jesus said you're either for me or against me. No in between. And Revelation says you're either you're neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm because you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. He doesn't say because you're cold, I'll vomit you out. I know where they stand. I can try to win them. But the lukewarm's killing me. It's making me sick. Okay? It's also very appropriate, I think, when we pray sometimes to realize we got to get out of the politics. Christians, there's no hope in it. There's no hope. What I've talked about right here is happening to Christians in Syria. Right now. Not one here, one there, but right now. I could get on the internet right here in the church and find videos of people having their throats cut for being a Christian. Okay? And I cannot imagine that, that the most famous where they walked all those Christians out to a beach-looking area and put them on their knees and sliced their throats. And We've read two or three quotes that got out from some of them that died that were quotes of forgiveness for the people that were doing it. But I cannot imagine what that'd do to, to... You'd have to say, I really believe, wouldn't you? I really believe. And uh, so... Let's, let's read some of what's said in 1 Peter with that as a backdrop. 1 Peter, the 4th chapter and the 14th verse, because what is said, we would tend to want to argue with. I think sometimes, I'm, I'm just saying by human nature, we would sometimes want to argue with it. 1 Peter 4, and I would suggest knowing this background you probably learned some things tonight about who the people were reading this letter. And listen what this great apostle says to him. Go home, read it all tonight. First Peter four fourteen. Let's start with twelve. Makes it Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you if though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Is that strong language? It's almost like we're directed to seek suffering. Uh, 15, if you suffer... It should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, as you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Could you be put in those stinky skins and thrown to wild animals and say, I praise God, I praise God with your last gurgling breaths as you bled out? And that's what he's telling them. He's not saying if you know somebody, but he's saying Christians, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. And, and I want to tell you what this teaches about suffering. Um, is when we suffer, we become like who? Christ. Now, as I've gotten older, I've thought a lot about that. And it makes sense for that guy on his knees getting his throat cut. But I think if I go to the doctor tomorrow, and this isn't some pie in the sky, it's never happened, but um, watching my mother die of cancer in those last days, watching her, and I always wonder, I know I'm going to die, you know you're going to die. Let me tell you something, this, this will make you think, is out of all the people who are sitting in this room now, just sitting here now, one of us is going to outlive all the rest. And one of us is going to be the next one to die out of this group. And we don't know which is which, do we? We don't know. Um, 
Amber, I like your odds better than mine from an age point of view. But, hey, you're not guaranteed to live to be 63, and I am. I look at it that way. Just a little shot at the young folk. But one of us is going to be the next to die, and one of us will outlive all the rest, and the rest of us are in between, right? But when I watched my mother die, and Kenneth and Jill's mom in that bang, bang, bang four-year period, I remember thinking they know they're going to die. I remember Eddie will remember this, Kenneth keeping his sense of humor and, and beat Eddie one time, <laughs> This Eddie's great golf proudness. He beat Eddie one stroke one time and then said, Eddie, you were a world-class athlete, weren't you? And Eddie said, yes, I was. And he said, well, I'm going to be dead in eight months and I just beat you. How does that make you feel? And Eddie said, both you boys are sick. The Clark boys are sick. But, but to be able to say, I know I'm going to be dead in six months. I know I'm going to be dead in eight months. What's that feel like? But that suffering, and I'm going to tell you, I knew my brother a long time. That suffering made him more like Christ. And I watched how my mother died, and I saw how a Christian dies. With the joys in her heart up until two or three hours before she died, and then she went to sleep. You know, but, but her last conscious, and her mind was sharp up until the last two or three hours. And when we suffer, how we die, be it at the hands of persecution or the hands of cancer, says a lot about becoming like Christ. And, and I think this scripture is so powerful for everybody that we just read. Let's, let's read a couple others that uh, turn to the second chapter. And uh, the 13th through 17th verse. And this is where it gets funky. Now, who's killing them? Before you read any of it, who's killing these Christians? Huh? The government. the government. It is a government endorsed slaughter of people because of their faith. Okay? And look what he says Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slave. Verse 17. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Are you crazy, Peter? Now, did Peter know what it was to suffer for Christ? Give me an example. Did he ever face death for Christ? He was in jail. He was in prison one night and thought he'd be dead the next morning. And it was only a miraculous way he got out. He knew that gut-wrenching feeling of I'm being done in in the morning. Right? Did you say something? He denied him three times, so he knew forgiveness, didn't he? One of the things that, and, and I think we've got to understand, he, he did not give any caveats here, and if there was ever going to be any handed out, it would have been here. Keep in mind, poles rammed up through people's body, oil poured on them. If there was any, any life left in them, the torturous death of that oil being lit. Um thrown to the wild animals, other things that were done to them. And keep in mind that, it, it, let's, let's read 2.15 again. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. If the Christians would have fought back with weapon and with word, what would the message have been? Okay, genocide. Let's assume the Christians have some strength and some pretty good weapons. What would the message have been? 
Hmm? Yeah. Both powerful. What did somebody back here say? Eye for an eye. May the best man win. Social evolution. Strong survive. And here's Peter saying, if you suffer, you become like Christ. Now which way will bring the most glory to God? If you suffer. If you humble yourself and suffer. That worries me about, and I want everybody to please listen real close. That worries me. And again, I've not gone out and looked at any bumper stickers, okay? That worries me about the political stance and the political, we have been reduced to political movement in our country called Christianity. And that does not bring glory to God. It does not. Now, am I saying we should be quiet and never say anything? No. But we should never say a word that's not governed in love. And it tells us multiple places in the Scripture, and I read one Sunday, in humility you count others as more important than yourself. And he says, when you're suffering, show them the love of Christ. And he goes back to whose example? Father, forgive them. Spoken by Jesus, who had done absolutely nothing wrong. Stephen, the first martyr, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Where do you think he learned that? He's quoting his Savior. And the anger we show sometimes, and uh, I saw a bumper sticker every day in the back of a truck. I was in Carter County. But it said, God, guns, and I don't remember what the other one was. Huh? Glory or something. And I think, don't just put God. He doesn't need. And I own 20 handguns. I enjoy shooting them. Not at people. At watermelons and targets. But don't, don't equate. Don't allow us to be reduced to a political party. If we're going to appeal to people... We do it by loving them when they're unlovable. We'll go back to Sunday's sermon. We do it by saying, if I can use this whole series, I will to being around other people, okay? And it's just powerful if you know the background of First Peter, what he was telling uh, these suffering Christians. So um, there, you can read through it, 414, 416, he gave you 213, 17, and 215, and see a whole, whole lot. Now, you're going to go through Second Peter, the fastest any human's ever gone through it. Second Peter, there's a lot of scripture. Second Peter is a totally different letter. It's not dealing with this anymore, but Second Peter, um, and I've just given you basically a bunch of scriptures there if you go to the back. So let me just, without reading them, tell you some of the things. He talks about a man of lawlessness. Now, I want to say this again. We read that. We don't know the background of the letter. And so everybody gets in, who's the man of lawlessness? And I personally believe it's either Barack Obama or Donald Trump. Now, is everybody happy? It used to be either Kennedy or Goldwater or Johnson or Goldwater. You know, Again, that political garbage we get into. It's the Pope. It's the preacher at the Baptist church because we're a Christian church. You know, it's some Methodist. And that people get into who's the man of lawlessness. But if you read about it in Second Peter, it's very practical. You don't need a code or some special author to write a book to explain it. So Second Peter 1, 4, he's talked about people that are Christians. So there's first three verses, you're Christians. And so 1-4 is you have escaped the corruption of this world. Verse 1-9, he talks about you have been purged of your sins. And verse or chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, he says, you are to live at all times showing the virtue of love. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to read them all. Okay? There's you some devotion tonight. Just read them. Just read them. And he rebukes, and this is where it gets in talking about the man of lawlessness, but it could be Ed's the man of lawlessness, and it could be Amber's the man of lawlessness, 
And it could be that Nathan is the man of lawlessness. It probably is that Andy's the man of lawlessness. And we all know Scott Lynn's the man of lawlessness. Right? So it's not talking about some guy with a code and we turn just right when the sun's at a certain angle, we can figure out who it is. It's talking about a person of lawlessness. And this is who they are. It rebukes them. Chapter 1, verse 20. Chapter 3, verse 16. Those who twist the scriptures. Somebody getting up here on Sunday morning and saying Jesus is not the Son of God is not a threat to this church. But somebody gets up here and says Jesus is the Son of God and then goes twisting it is a threat because people will listen. Right? And so he, he calls the man of lawlessness, that person, someone who twists the Scripture. In chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, he says they are people who will exploit others. The results of this, we'll read those. The results of this in uh, 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 2, um, verse 4. So he said, there were false prophets among the people, just there will be false prophets among you today. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought, bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories, you know, followed by money. Their condemnation has been, long been hanging over them. Their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in the chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So that's what's going to happen to somebody who knows and is doing wrong. Uh, 2 5 if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its only godly un, ungodly people but protected noah a preacher of righteousness and seven others and then verse uh, 6 if he condemned the cities of sodom and gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly if he rescued lot a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless um, he goes on um, if he did that He's going to punish people who are the people of lawlessness, who twist the scriptures, who turn it into something to exploit other people for whatever gain they want. Uh, Billy Graham made the quote one time, and it bothered me a little bit because I thought, you know, respect Billy Graham, but I thought, can you really say that? Because it's like you, but he said, if God didn't bring judgment to the United States for our morality, then he would owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And, you know, I, it made me uncomfortable to say God owed anybody an apology for anything, but, but I understand what he meant. But when you read this, it's got a little bit of scriptural basis to it. And, and all Peter's saying is, you're handling the righteousness of God. Don't allow somebody to tell you that sin is okay, or it's changed, or twisted, or turn it in. And the last thing I'll give you, and just write these verses down. It will tell you they are people in 2.10 and 2.18. Just write those references down. you got room. 2.10 and 2.18, they are people governed by lust. 2.14 talks about adultery. 2.10 talks about their arrogance and self-will. 219 talks about a moral a moral liberty that is really chains. Now let's just comment on that one real quick. How often do people say, I'm free from the chains of Christianity, I can live any way I want, when what they've done is chained themselves and called it liberty? You know. And that's that's an argument we hear when we try to combine politics with Christianity quite often. We hear a lot of that today. I'm free, I'm free, you know, when it's the chains of sin. And then 2.14 and 2.18, and I want you to hear this. I wish I could scream it from a rooftop and people hear it. 
they will recruit other people to sin. Okay? Sin recruits sin uh, and makes it beautiful. Um, 2.14, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They're experts in greed. They're an accursed brood. Um, 2.18 says, for they mouth empty words, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. Um, sin recruits sin. That is a fact of life. Sin will recruit sin. And if you learn nothing, not learn that. Sin recruits sin. Or you can word it this way. Sin begets sin. Sin gives birth to sin in others. So if someone, is that not true? Go back to a child. You're raising a child and they get caught doing something wrong. Some minor infraction, and you, you bring them in, you're talking to them about it, and they may say, well, Billy's daddy lets him. What's he doing? Trying to recruit. Okay? What are we but children when we stand before God? And we start saying, well, I know this goes against God's will. I know it's wrong, but... And we do that. So rather than trying to find that man of lawlessness, I think we need to look at the positive side of this book, which is those first verses, and say, wow, I've been set free from that. I get to live under the law of love. And then to think about First Peter and what those people went through and, and quit making the judgments about people and say, you know, we just shouldn't be saying go, there's roles of government that are not ours. Not ours, okay? Um, we've run out of time, so we'll close. Thank you all. Andy Hull, would you close us in prayer, please?